Okay, carbohydrates. First of all, we should understand that carbohydrates are functionally, at least in this topic, in, in topic one, they are energy storage molecules. Okay, yes, we do have cellulose in plants, which is not for energy storage, it's, it's for structural support. Carbohydrates are energy storage molecules, and the simplest one that you have to know about is alpha glucose. So we're going to draw alpha glucose first. key thing about alpha glucose is that the OH group at carbon 1 is in the down orientation. Okay. So we've got alpha glucose here and important things to note about its structure is that this is carbon number one right here okay so the numbering begins after the oxygen and that's carbon number one that's two that's three and that's four okay that's five and that's six so one four and six they tend to come up a lot in in the next few uh, bits about carbohydrate structure, so I'm going to point them out to you. Okay, so that's carbon 1, this is carbon 4, and this is carbon 6 up here. So, key things about glucose is that it is soluble, and therefore it, it can be uh, transported easily transported in uh, the transport medium. In most cases that's blood, but not necessarily. So it's soluble because it's got a it's got many OH groups and that makes it polar. So it's soluble, it can be transported in the transport medium. And uh, the other key thing is that it's relatively small. Again that helps in its um, transport but the other key thing is that because of its uh, chemical structure, it can be uh, broken down in respiration. So in respiration, it is effectively oxidized. So when you say break down, you don't really get any credit for that. But the key word here is it's oxidized. So in respiration, glucose is oxidized okay, effectively broken down, ox oxidized to carbon dioxide, and ATP is produced. Remember, it is again wrong to say that glucose is converted into ATP. The, e the gl glucose is oxidized, and the energy released from that process is used to make ATP. Okay, very important difference. But this is the main thing about alpha glucose, is that this is the energy storage or you know the energy the immediate energy source for most processes okay and respiration is the uh, the process by which the energy in in, in carbon in glucose is extracted okay so now let's move on so glucose has these properties and that makes it good for transport it makes it it good as an immediate energy store however however for storage it is not great okay so if you want to store lots of alpha glucose you can't just um, collect a lot of this in the cell 
you need to make it into disaccharides and which are still soluble, so that's a problem um, for, for long term storage or, or for kind of storing more glucose you need to make it into a polysaccharide okay so let's just look at this so uh, this is a monosaccharide so alpha glucose is a mono saccharide okay now next thing we're going to look at is how monosaccharides might be uh, how, how monosaccharides can be used to make disaccharides so that involves the glycosidic bond Okay, so monosaccharides can be joined together to form disaccharides, and the way that happens is by condensation reaction. Okay, condensation reaction. Right, and what's going to happen is that you've got the OH group from one monosaccharide react uh, joins with the H hydrogen from another monosaccharide forming a water molecule and in that process so once they form the water molecule what happens is that the remaining oxygen bonds to the carbon from the mon next monosaccharide and we have a glycosidic bond form. So condensation reaction, water formed, glycosidic bond formed, and in this case the bond is from carbon 1 to carbon 4. Remember 1, 2, 3, and 4. So this is a 1 to 4 glycosidic bond between alpha glucose molecules. Now, disaccharides, so uh, the, the, the disaccharide that we've made here, that is called maltose. It's still soluble, uh, it's still a relatively small molecule, it's still soluble, so it still has much of the same drawbacks as glucose in terms of its storage, because remember, even though glucose is a great immediate energy store and can be used for respiration, you can't store lots of glucose in a cell as glucose because it's going to draw too much water in by osmosis because glucose is a solute. So what you need to do is convert these you need to convert these soluble molecules into large insoluble molecules, i.e. polysaccharides. So the same principle applies though, okay? So the idea is that monosaccharides monosaccharides and disaccharides are immediate immediate sources of res Res let's call them respiratory fuels. Okay, so they are good for putting into respiration, but but draw too much water into cells by osmosis. So you can't have lots of glucose sitting around. Therefore, therefore, glucose is converted into insoluble polysaccharide. Okay, so it's like putting money in the bank. All right, it's not as easy to get to, but at least you can put lots of it there. So glucose, insoluble polysaccharide, and as and then when you so for storage okay so for storage you put it convert it into the insoluble polysaccharide and then you can if you need to you can break it down again back into glucose so that you can use it 
for respiration. You can't use the insoluble polysaccharide immediately for respiration. Okay, so this is the idea. And, um, again, the glucose is, and the way this happens, is by condensation reaction, except for, it's not just between two glucose molecules, it is um, joining two glucose molecules together, then adding a third on, then adding a fourth on, and then a fifth, and then a sixth, and so on. Okay, and, and when you join many, many glucose molecules together, you get the polysaccharides, which are insoluble. Alright, now, so let's look at the main ones. So you have two, basically. So you have plants, plant polysaccharides, and you have animal polysaccharides. Okay, so plant and animal. So in the plant, you have starch. And in animal, you have glycogen. And in starch, you've got two forms. So you've got amylose and amylopectin. And in glycogen, you've just got glycogen. So that makes it easy. So amylose is when you join... So you, um, uh, when you join glucose molecules together, it's like in a coiled form, like so. And in a myelopectin, you've got branching happening, like so. Okay, so let's just zoom in here. In a mylose, you've got, again, you do have... 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds okay uh, you do have 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds and it is unbranched so these are structural points it's unbranched functional points then it is so I'll just change my pen it is oh, that's not a good color it is um, compact so it's a good store of glucose because it's compact, it's insoluble, okay, um, that's pretty much it, all right, however, it's not a, doesn't release glucose so quickly because it's, it doesn't have a lot of branching. So let's then go back to amylopectin, now amylopectin, because of the branching, it's got both one to four glycosidic bonds, and it's got one to six glycosidic bonds. That's so. So, at, so these one to six bonds are happening at the branch points. Okay, but otherwise, um, the one to four bonds are happening along the chain. All right. So, we describe this amylopectin as branched. And the key functional point here is that this increases increases the ter number of terminal ends. Okay, and because you've got more endings, so enzymes could act here, 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 here. So because you've got more ends where the enzymes could work instead of just here for amylose, this increases increases the rate of hydrolysis of, of the polysaccharide and rate of glucose release, not energy. Please remember that simply converting the amylopectin or glycogen into glucose is not making energy yet because the glucose hasn't gone through respiration. Okay, so um, the branching increases the rate of glucose release, not energy release. Okay, indirectly, yes, it does increase the rate of energy release, but you know that's not what your examiners are looking for. Right, so uh, with glycogen, it's very similar to amylopectin, except glycogen is in animals. It's stored mainly in your muscles and in your liver. 
um, for obvious reasons. Yeah, so your your, your muscles need the respiration f for the ATP, and therefore the and the ATP is needed for the muscle contraction. So glycogen is stored in muscles, so they have an immediate source of glucose. They don't have to rely, in the short term at least, for glucose to be supplied in the blood. Okay, so let's begin with glycogen then. So glycogen, the only difference is that glycogen is very highly branched. Very highly branched, and so it has lots and lots of terminal ends that the enzymes can act on. And release glucose. Okay, so let's in the structural points. It has it has one to four, and one to six, alpha glycosidic bonds, and it is highly branched. If you need to contrast that with a myelopectin, it ha does have more branching. So it's highly branched. Okay. And because of the branching, it, in effect, it it stores stores more more glucose, um, you know, per kind of unit volume. Yeah. Um, and functional points then again, um, high rate, high rate of hydrolysis because of those terminal ends and therefore high rate of glucose release okay remember glucose not just energy um yeah and that that is it okay so mm -hmm.